the high-speed rail, the promise of it was that you'd be able to get on a train in LA and with ideas that maybe there'd be other destinations added along the way. And the decision was made to start in Fresno because if you you build in the valley, it's agricultural land, there's less of a possibility that the project would be delayed because you aren't going through somebody's backyard like the urban areas. But the reality of the situation is we have a bunch of rules about how you have to build in California. And there was resistance to the route that was chosen and it went through people's properties that had been farming for generations. And it created a lot of stress and litigation, which slowed everything right. down. Hello and welcome again to another episode of Sacktown Talks. Today, we're glad to be rejoined by Senator Anna Caballero. Anna, how's it going? Thanks for coming in person today. Thank you so much. Yeah, Pleased to be here. It's good to see you. You know, last time we did this on Zoom, so it's uh, it's good to be face to face finally. Absolutely. Yeah. It's 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 good. It's a good day when we can do this together. <laughs> the, the world has changed. Uh, you know, last time you know you kind of talked to us about about your background and you know going to law school and stuff like mm -hmm. that. So I guess for the listeners who you know didn't hear that, um, kind of can you talk really quickly, kind of what inspired you to get into politics and kind of bring you here today? Yes. Um, well, my family is from a copper mining community in Arizona. And it's a company owned town. Mm -hmm. And if you want to work, you work for the company. Right. And if you don't like your, the groceries that you buy at the store or the service you get at the bowling alley or um, anything that, it, that they control, you just keep your mouth shut and you don't do anything about it, including the hospital if, it, if you get poor service. And I saw my family struggle um, in, this, in this company town and to see that they really had no resources to talk to an attorney. Mm -hmm. It's isolated in the middle of nowhere. And for me, I felt um, a real sense of injustice seeing how, how much they struggled. It was a Latino community. Um, Copper's pretty important. Right. We take it for granted. Our phones work because of it. Batteries work. Did you say we take it from granite? Oh uh, yeah, we, we take yeah, it is. <laughs> it is. Wish I had thought of that myself. But um but that, that injustice made me feel like what I wanted to do with my life, knowing that I, I had to go to college, mm -hmm. which is obligatory. My parents insisted on it. Um, and I actually, it was a good decision for me. Yeah. Um, I wanted to do something with my life that made me feel like I could help people to understand what their rights were and what options they had. Give them options and obviously give them advice so they can make choices. Um, so I went to law school, I hated it. Mm -hmm. um, it was during a really difficult time uh, when uh, special admissions program were under attack. And since I was a special admissions admittee ad to UCLA yeah. Law School, um, there was a feeling that we didn't belong there and um, that we shouldn't be taking someone else's spot. And, um, and so it was a difficult time. Uh, but I got hired by California Rural Legal Assistance. I was inspired by the the uh, labor movement, uh, Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta and the UFW, and uh, wanted to work with farm workers. And so I ended up in Salinas thinking I'd be there a few years. Mm -hmm. And um, I, st I stayed many. And one of the things that happened is I got involved in politics, which I had never intended to do as an elected official, but as an, a community organizer, right. organizing people to, to exercise their right to vote. And um, and in the end, if you see something that has that needs to be fixed, um, it's pretty hard to organize people to do it unless you're willing to then step up and say, OK, I'll be the candidate and, right. and I'll, I'll take on the responsibility to make sure it happens. And so you know, fast forward a number of years, here I am still, um, I found that I really enjoy um, solving problems and I enjoy the the tension between the public demands that people make and the um, the way that government works. It doesn't mm -hmm. work as fast as we'd like it to. Yeah. And, um, and making sure that uh, we're being practical when we do things, because sometimes that's lost in politics, right. so um, I, I I enjoy what what I well I I ended up in law practice for twenty five years had my own law practice so I ran a small business and my community service was serving on the city council and as mayor um, but once I I ran for the state assembly it was a different story right. closed the law office and made a commitment to do it full time 
No, yeah, it's that we were talking to, with Blanca Pacheco yesterday, and you know, being the attorney and doing the city council, and the mayor, that's that's it's a, a lot real of work. Grind, right? It's a lot of work, and yeah. I had three young children, so wow. that went home to three little kids that yeah. you know needed my time and attention and dinner and baths and all that kind right. of good homework stuff. So and, homework, oh my gosh, gosh, homework, yep. Wow, what a what a struggle. Um, so kind of you know, we just had redistricting. Everyone you know kind of shifted. Kind of how did things change for you in, in your district? Well, the big change is that. Um, the, my my district originally included the Salinas Valley in San Benito mm-hmm. County, as well as two thirds of the district was in the Central Valley, right. and um, the biggest community in that district was Salinas, mm-hmm. which I had represented as a mayor and city council member. Um, the district shifted and became an entirely a Central Valley district, and includes now eighty percent of the city of Fresno. So the biggest city in the district wow. shifted to Fresno. Um, it, but but uh, essentially the footprint otherwise is the same in the Central Valley. Um, interestingly enough, the Salinas Valley and San Benito County went, uh, rather than electing someone every four years, has to wait six. And so they're um, th- currently they don't they're 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 not represented by anybody. So uh, the rules committee, basically set up a structure because there are many communities like that mm-hmm. that um, that asked senators to con- either continue representing areas that they uh, no longer had as part of the redistricting or to take on the responsibility until there's an election in that district um, as a and and part of that is that to put that, community as part of the new district without there being an election mm-hmm. means you'd give the uh, the senator an advantage in the upcoming election oh, in two years. Yeah. So I was asked to continue representing the Salinas Valley and San Benito County, despite the fact that they're not officially part of my district. Now they are for two years. Right. Yeah, I was about to ask you because you know that's where you kind of you know cut your teeth, right? Yes. In San Benito County and Salinas, yes. and I guess for that not to be in your district anymore, kind of how's that feel? But I guess you kind of get the best well, of both I, worlds. I, a bit, I right? do <laughs> have the best of both worlds right now. Yes, yeah. and you know what? I'm I'm uh, I'm just incredibly honored to be asked to do that because um, that that's where I had my law practice, mm-hmm. both in Salinas and in Hollister, right. and um, so I know I know the folks there, and I've I've. Um, I've represented many of them for many, many years. So right. I'm glad to continue doing that. And then there will be an election. And um, I expect that John Laird, who w- will be, is that is now part of that coastal district, mm-hmm. um, will win. And and he's got to run. Six years? In no, six, in two years. Two it's years, in okay. two years. I'm sorry if I said six. Okay. Uh, it's in two That's years. <laughs> uh, then, yeah, no, that would, that, that would, uh, that would be just right. uh, too much because my my term ends in four. So for to give me two, six yeah. years over there would, would be crazy. Would be crazy. <laughs> yep. So yeah, so it's uh, it's a good transition yeah. um, plan, and the Senate has districts all over the and communities all over the state where mm-hmm. that's the situation. Yeah. Think so about, you were just reelected, right, for a fresh four year term. I was. There, right? I was this um, past election. So you, you know, you went out, you talked to constituents, kind of. In your opinion, what what's front of mind on your constituents, and kind of what are they telling you that they want you to focus on? Well, the number one issue continues to be jobs, good jobs. Um, the unemployment rate is the lowest it's been in 50 years in the state of California. That's a great thing. But um, there is a real interest because it's a rural agricultural community, um, other than Fresno, Fresno is an urban center. Um, people want good jobs. They want jobs that will allow them to buy a house, to be able to pay for a college education for their children if, if they so desire. And um, and a, a ladder that they can climb up, and so that that uh, the, along with um, affordable housing, and uh, um, and a robust economic um, infrastructure for the small communities to do what we're asking them to do. We want them to um, focus on building more housing. Mm. Uh, they don't have the infrastructure to do that, uh, and so. It's a partnership. They they want some help in 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 achieving some of their goals. And I I've, I've worked really hard. I've been able to get money in the state budget. As a real quick example, uh, the city of Huron um, 
if you have a heart attack or a um, stroke or a traffic accident, uh, you have to wait 30 minutes for an ambulance to get there. They come from Colinga. And so they were told by the amb ambulance company, if you build us an ambulance bay, which includes living quarters and a kitchen, mm -hmm. um, we'll set an ambulance up there. And so you can have immediate service. Really, really important to their community. Right. Um, so we, I was able to get them some money in the budget for an ambulance, an ambu ambulance bay. Um, the city of San Joaquin that has a budget of $750,000 a year was was having a significant increase in gang violence in the in the community and so i was able to get them some money that they then went out to the community it was 2 million dollars that they went to the community and said what is it you want and um and so they they are working on a, a youth violence uh, prevention program that has reduced gang violence activity in their community. The same thing with Mendota. Um, so, so I, the infrastructure becomes real important. Madera, they had a, a, a sewer issue, the sewer line that they need to replace. I was able to get them five million dollars. They can't wow. add houses to that sewer system until they they do upgrades. Right. Um, so you know it's 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 helping these small communities so then they can meet the the obligations that the state has put on them to build housing and and to um and, and to um to keep up the inf their infrastructure as right. well right like roads and and those kinds of things yeah it's kind of interesting we were talking you know off camera before about you know i guess driving back and forth home and you're saying you know you take the train right yes um so kind of you know you know, 99 can be a big pain in the butt. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Talk about roads and traffic and repair. Uh, kind of what, why do you take the train and kind of what, you know, how is, how is the train ride down there? How long does it take? So, so, um, train service to the Valley is, is really very, very convenient. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, it is, uh, I, I, I take it regularly to Merced when I can, and it's a, it's a two hour train ride. Um, it's the same as all, yeah. driving a car. Right. The the difference is that I get to sit on the train. I have internet access. I can get caught up with my emails. Right. I can do work. Um, it it's really a lot less stress than getting in a car on Highway 99 mm -hmm. and um, fighting all the traffic. Um, the Central Valley is the um, provide. There are more trucks on on Highway 99 than anywhere else in the state, and it. It is a uh, a travel route for all of the produce tr trucks that are leaving the valley, going to the ports in order right. to send our our, our goods out, um, and so it's it's really very busy. It's pretty potholy mm -hmm. in yep. the slow lane, yep. <laughs> and um, and this is just really a, a great opportunity for me not to have to worry about um, you know the the kind of the liability and the the stress that's related to to taking that trip. Yeah. So I try to take the train as much as possible. And it's kind of interesting. Like I, I just saw like on uh, social media somewhere, they did a map of Europe with all their rail lines. And then they did a map of the United States and they're like literally like thousands of rail lines in Europe. It's like covered. You can't even see any like space. And in the United States, there's like, there feels like there's like 10 total rail lines. Well, it's, <laughs> and, and you it's, know what? The, the challenge is, is the passenger tra train service mm -hmm. takes second fiddle to the transport train. So if there's a transport train coming through, then they move you off to a sidetrack right. and the, um, the, the, uh, the transport goes first. And so there are times when you get delayed um, and there are um, accidents on the track that delay you, but that can happen on 99. Right. You get one traffic accident and all of a sudden everything comes oh, to a gosh. complete stop. Yep. There's no frontage road along 99, no. which is what, what creates the, the, the stress of, of driving on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so kind of like the, the, I guess the solution we all kind of dreamed about, I don't know, was it 10, 15 years ago was high speed rail, right? We'd be Correct. able to go from here to the, you know, to the Valley, to LA, to San Francisco, super fast. Uh, and, you know, I thought it was going to be, you know, pretty quick, but here we are years and years later and it, you know, we just got a little strip, you know, kind of where you live down in, down in Merced kind of, right. what's the status of high speed rail and kind of, kind of what are your current thoughts on it? Well, you know, high speed rail was supposed to go from L.A. to San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the idea was that it would be fast right. and it would create um, the ability to be able to move across the state without having to fly, which has become increasingly expensive and, or drive a car. 
Right. Um, I was driving up from LA once to go to Fresno and I got part of the way and they closed the grapevine because it was snowing up there. Mm-hmm. So all of a sudden I had to go through Palmdale. It was incredibly difficult to get to Fresno. Right. And um, because I it was a last minute thing, I couldn't get any tickets because there weren't any available. And so there is no train from LA into the Central Valley. You have to go up the coast over to, to the Bay Area and down again, which is just crazy. Yeah. So um, the high-speed rail, the promise of it was that you'd be able to get on a train in L.A. and with ideas that maybe there'd be other destinations mm-hmm. added along the way and um, and could get to the Central Valley, but then cut over to the Bay Area and go up, up, up the Bay to San Francisco. Um, the decision was made to start in Fresno. Because if you you build in the valley, it's agricultural land. There's less of a, right. at least the idea was it was um, less of a possibility that the project would be delayed because you you aren't going through somebody's backyard right, right, right. in the urban like the urban areas. Um, but the reality of the situation is we have a bunch of rules about how how you have to build in California, and we mm-hmm. didn't expedite any of them. And uh, and there was resistance to the route that was chosen and it went through people's properties that had been farming for generations and it created a lot of stress and um and litigation which slowed everything right. down so um so yes you're absolutely right the um phase 1 part of it is Bakersfield to Merced and approximately 2 thirds of it is under construction right now and if if you never drive through the valley along 99 you'll never see it right. so it's out of sight out of mind you think oh what's happening i you know there's nothing well it's incredible to see it going up yeah it's one of the most impressive cement structures You're absolutely like, what is that? well you go across yeah. the you you go to the san joaquin river right. and it's one of the most beautiful bridges mm-hmm. that that you'll see um what I'm excited about is one of the um, anybody who's lived in the valley will tell you that the most frustrating thing is to be driving from east to west and to be stopped by a, a train that is um, coming along the tracks that ha- has conflicts with the road. Right. right. Um, and there are a bunch. I, I want to say there are 55 in the Central Valley and you could be there for 10 minutes oh, because yeah. that. That uh, transport train is not moving very right. fast. Um, and if you're in a hurry, you're in trouble. Those are being elevated. So they're, um, it's, in, it's a safety improvements for the small communities as you go, and, and for Fresno, because Fresno has a bunch. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, and so, as I said, two thirds of, of the, um, the, the entire, it's a 500 mile route. And- um, Just from- but Merced to Bakersfield. No, it's oh. from uh, L.A. to San Francisco. Okay. But uh, the environmental work has been done on uh, over 400 miles of that route. So that's really what has slowed this project down is getting through the environmental um, um, issues okay. that that occur whenever you're you're building something across the entire state okay. almost, right? And it through some of the most. Um, uh, iconic and beautiful areas. So you want to make sure that you, you do the environmental work right so that it, it um, you're, you're assuring people that we're being environmentally sensitive. Mm-hmm. But, but the other part of it is that um, the high-speed rail was one of the goals that was adopted by the state in order to achieve our climate goals, right. get people out of their cars. And so it is, you need to protect the environment and also build in a way that um, encourages people to actually use it. So the um, the route right now is under construction is between, um, well, the route is almost to Bakersfield and almost to Merced. Um, that's already under construction right now, creating thousands of jobs. And if I recollect correctly, um, there's a priority given to uh, making purchases from small businesses and something like um, 750 small businesses have been uh, part of the uh, project, including s- small cement companies and steel companies, um, really important job opportunities for people in, in the Valley, mm-hmm. which is an economic economically distressed area of the state. So it, I think the idea in starting in Fresno was to uh, show an impact 
and to encourage the city of Fresno to do to start the work that that's going to be needed in order to do have a high speed rail train mm -hmm. in their downtown area because right now it goes through all of the downtown areas of the communities that it's going to traverse. Right. So it's very cool. Yeah, it's. You know, that was, I guess, the, the idea, like, back in, well, it feels like it was, like, 2008 or, you know, somewhere way back then. About um, way back then. Uh, that the whole idea was, you know, we were start talking about climate change and things like that. Mm -hmm. It was, like, you needed to be able to live somewhere where you could kind of go to work in a kind of a green fashion, right? Like, right. You, you should build houses near near jobs or something right. like that. And, you know, here in California, we have the affordability problem. Like, you can't live you know, you can't buy a house in, you know, the Bay Area because it's too expensive. Right. And so, well, then the next solution is, well, how can we transport people from where it's affordable to live to where they can work? Right. Uh, and it kind of seemed like high-speed rail was kind of like the, the silver bullet for that. Well, um, I think that was one of the one of the hopes for right. it, right? Um, and it's it's because it's taken so long, it's one of the unrealized question marks. Are we going to be able to really um, make the changes? It's land use changes. Mm -hmm. And then investment, and we're hoping it's private investment that comes in and helps to build that housing that you're talking right. about, as well as commercial quarters, so people can live where they can shop. Um, Fresno's done a really good job of uh, doing that. Uh, they have prepared the area. It's just a question of getting right. that train, you exactly. know, uh, more with more certainty. And then, so, you know, I guess I don't know. Maybe people feel like maybe the project stalled or stopped. Um, maybe funding is, is lacking. Can you, do you have any update on that or kind of where they are in funding or are they current, still working or? Oh, it's, um, it's, um, it's under construction. Okay. It's, so it's still, still going. it's still going. Um, the, uh, what, what has happened is that, um, Simon, what, what the, what the authority did is, um, get itself ready to do, um, request for proposals for the in so so the concrete structure is going up, but what still has to be purchased are the train tracks, the trains, um, and all, all the operating um, mechanics. Mm -hmm. um, it will be electric, so it means electrification of the right. track track as well as the um, the equipment that they would use to keep the trains on time and to do all that kind of good stuff. Um, because the economy has changed in the in the past. 18 months to two years, um, the High Speed Rail Authority has put that on hold and um, they're, they're going to be reassessing where they're going to be making the purchases and how they're going to do the requ request for proposals. Let me just tell you that my, my push for, to them, um, and there isn't really legislative um, proposals that require them to do any of this, but I'd like them to buy as much from California as possible. We don't produce most of that stuff. Right. As a matter of fact, this country doesn't produce most of it. It's produced in other countries, mm -hmm. very similar to um, solar panels on houses. If you wanna put solar panel on your house, it likely comes from Germany or China. So for us to be buy spending billions of dollars in infrastructure money for, um, for items that we, if we reorganized uh, our business could could come back to, to California or to or to the United States for that matter by American. Um, it, it, now's the time because if we can do it in California, it could be done anywhere in the country. And you're absolutely right. Our country needs to invest in this kind of infrastructure if we're really going to get people out of their cars, and if if we're going to be able to handle the transportation needs of people into the future. Which means that as our population grows. We have to be able to have the transportation methods that allow people to travel and to visit and to to see the country. Mm -hmm. um, and there's huge areas where you can't get there without a car at all. California is one of, one of those. We right. we we did it on purpose, right? So um, so the purchasing of those items are placed on hold until the economy improves a improves a little bit um, for a variety of reasons. One was the um, the transportation issues, um, the uh, supply chain issues is, is what, oh, right, what they right. were calling it, right? Uh, 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 materials sitting at the ports, they couldn't be unloaded and, mm -hmm. and sent, uh, sent around the country. And, um, and because of the high, high cost of some of the building materials, because um, we're importing it from other countries. Right. And so um, until that market improves, uh, that's going to be placed on hold. 
Um, it it was going to be bought in anticipation of being of using it, but the idea is to wait until um, the bids will come back come back better. Um, and uh, and I support that. We want the best bids possible. Right. And I also think that um, if we're going to be buying um, buying uh, all of that material, that we ought to do it in bulk so that. W- when the concrete structure is finished along the 171 mile route that um that it's it's we can buy it bring it install it and we're ready to yeah. roll do you know like so like w- when it was first pitched it was like you know we thought we we're gonna get this like you know tokyo style or europe style you know 200 mile an hour plus kind of super fast bullet train is that still the idea or are we looking at a slower train or uh, it's still the idea mm-hmm. okay. the, the the real question is going to be um uh, uh, that there it it will go through some environmentally sensitive areas and um and so you you have to you may have to accommodate for some of that but the idea is that it is going to be able to train as an example um the route takes it through um in merced mm-hmm. through a wetlands area um and so it it and for a whole bunch of reasons in terms of of um what's out in that particular region and and so there are some protections. We want to make sure that you know we don't create a wetland and then and then send a train through it without protecting the birds right. that are that are there. You know, wintering over the over over a harsh winter. So so there are a number of areas like that where where um, the building has to accommodate, and that that will probably be through a tube, uh, a tube type structure okay. to, that protects them. Um, still fast, right. but, you know, a little bit different than what That's we thought. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's kind of people always ask, they're like, you know, we do these exemptions for stadiums and things like that all the time. Is there a legislative appetite to kind of help speed this up with some exemptions on, on some of these environmental reviews? Or I would like to think yes, but um, it hasn't happened yet. So we'll see. <laughs> and yeah, and of- I, I, you're absolutely right. When it's a private investment mm-hmm. and um, the, the private investors insist that it happened faster. Right. And it's kind of like I don't think we've ever seen bills on high speed rail or kind of things that you're talking about, like nope. buy the trains from the. What? Why, why do you think that is? That is it because it was an initiative and it's it's hard to touch or. You know, I think that's what it is. Or? I think I think that's what it is. Okay. Yeah, I was always wondering that. It's kind of like, uh, you know, it's it's interesting. Well, thank you. You know, we you know we get a lot of requests on kind of high speed rail and kind of where where is it going and right. uh, is it ever going to happen? So you know, it's finally great to have someone on who's who's been keeping an eye on it. Well, I love seeing the progress that's being that's being made and. If you like, I said, if you never drive through the valley, you right. don't see any of the infrastructure going up. It's massive. It's massive, and um, I think it's in. It's going to be incredibly beautiful. And the idea probably would have been a lot faster to do it up along um, Highway Five, uh, but people don't live there, right. and you really want it where people live. Oh, um, yeah. And and what I can tell you is that um, because of the high cost of housing in the Bay Area, more and more working uh, people are moving out to Patterson and to Los Baños to communities in the Central Valley mm-hmm. um, and commuting two hours a day, one way. And so if we can get people out of their cars and moving together um, on, on something that's really efficient, that's the way to go. No, that no. way they can get home faster, they can take care of their family responsibilities and they can feel a part of the community as opposed to sitting in their car all by themselves. Right. You know, the, the California middle class has really been squeezed and kind of declined. Very much. Yeah. Um, and kind of, you guys have a proposal out this year with SB6. Kind of, what are you looking to do with SB6? Um, yeah, from last year? Yeah. So so SB6 um, was really was really a, a labor of love. And mm-hmm. what, what it is, is that California, well, once Proposition 13 passed, that protected the property tax of homeowners from huge uh, increases in uh, in property tax. Mm-hmm. It left local communities without the resources to do things that they that they felt very um, strongly they should continue to do. Um, it took away the ability to do recreational programs and libraries and police services and fire services. And so it w- led to the fiscalization of land use in California, which means that if you're, you couldn't increase property taxes, 
the tax you could increase was sales tax. And um, it led to communities saying, we need more uh, stores in our community so that we have the money to meet the service needs. And so um, that meant they built, they overbuilt the commercial um, infrastructure in the community. There are way too many stores, right? And so what happened is, is we, our shopping trends have changed. Mm -hmm. Um, we went to these super stores, the Costco's and the Walmart's right. and they're super, right? And now people are using the internet to buy their goods. And so you no longer have the need for as many commercial spaces as you did before. They turned into Blockbusters and Craigans and 99 cent stores. And even those are, are now leaving as well. So right. there are huge vacant commercial spaces, some along strip malls some along uh, malls, and uh, they're vacant. Uh, Sears, Toys R Us, you know, big, big spaces, Kmart's, and they're sitting vacant, waiting for someone to do something with them. And and it's really hard to find someone that can rent or buy that big a space. So SB6 basically said, we have sequed these, these buildings to death, we we knew that they were going to bring lots of people in during periods of time. And so in terms of the environmental issues, it it built off work that had been done by Senator Weiner, um, SB 35, which uh, provided an expedited process for um, for um, land use. And and what this bill, my bill would do, SB 6, is it says their infill structure, their infill um in their infill uh, parcels, um, let's allow local government to set up a ministerial process so that you can come in and add housing as part of the mix so that you can build um, mixed use mm-hmm. um, that would include a down a downstairs where you have some commercial and upstairs um, right. uh, condos or, or apartments. And that way, if you purchase or, or rent one of these, um, you get home, you walk to the little grocery store that's there, you need a haircut, you, you go get a haircut. It's all within walking distance. It'll reduce greenhouse gas, vehicle miles traveled, and it'll provide a place for people to live um, uh, in, a, in a community right. without impacting the, the neighborhoods. Um, you know, people get nervous about building increasing densities mm-hmm. in in a residential neighborhood. This doesn't do it. It's a commercial neighborhood. And it'll start providing an opportunities for communities to very quickly add housing that becomes much more affordable. You don't have to buy the buy the land necessarily. It's already owned by somebody right. and they can add to it. Um, and um, it'll increase property taxes for the c- cities, which is good for them. Right. And it, it will alleviate the need to be boarding up buildings that um, will stay vacant for a significant amount of time. The, the, the analysis shows very clearly that, um, that we have overbuilt commercial. And so we need to do something with that land. And, and, and then you're not using agricultural land. You're not building on agricultural land and on farmland right. or, or, or um, uh, parkland outside on the outskirts. In other words, you're reducing sprawl and, bu- and building up. That's interesting because you do see a lot of old shopping centers that just Absolutely. don't exist anymore. Especially Absolutely. You know, here in Sacramento, you see them every, That's right. everywhere. Well, if you if you drive around, all of a sudden you'll realize how many there are. Mm-hmm. And um, a really good example of how they've they're they're doing some of that change is along Broadway here in here in Sacramento. I was driving down the street the other day, and I was I was shocked at how many vacant buildings, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, commercial buildings there are in the. And, and that's funny. That's a lot of people. I always wondered, like here downtown, like why don't people redo these old buildings? Right. Somebody said Prop 13 because there's no incentive for the person right. who owns the building to redo it because then their basis changes. That's right. And so now they're basically paying nothing for property tax and they're getting whatever rent they get. But if they, you know, were to redo the building, it would just go up way, way more. So right. I was like, oh, that's fascinating. Yep. So basically, like the city has to take it, like. Um, or you really have to incentivize these landlords to, to do something. To so. do something, unless it's part of a zone where you, you can do mixed use. Right. And um, the, the challenge with that is normally in what the city has to do is go back and make a land use change. 
And that land use change can be expensive. It can be iffy mm. and, um, and it takes time right. and time is money. If you can do something now, then it's a lot quicker. Yeah. No, and it's kind of like, you know, we've been talking about revitalizing like downtown Sacramento for ever know, for 50 years, probably. It's <laughs> probably it, true. You know, 20 years. Uh, it just still, it's just never happened. You're like, man, what's it finally going to take? Uh, but it looks like some of these changes you guys are making may have a, an impact sooner rather than later. Hopefully it, it can, it can be expedited. You yeah. talked about expediting right. projects. This was a real simple uh, opportunity to expedite that process. No, that's great. Um, so we just had the bill introduction deadline, kind of what's your legislative package looking like and kind of what are some of the things you're looking to tackle this year? Well, um, I'm, I'm still going to work on housing. Housing is a big issue for me. Um, and the focus, uh, this session is on senior housing, Mm -hmm. senior homelessness is the fastest growing population or the growing, the, the fastest growing population of homelessness is our seniors over the age of 55. Um, and, um, I just think that you spend your entire life working, you get to retirement age, uh, many are on fixed incomes and, um, and the increase in rent is, is driving many of them out into the streets. Right. And so I think we, it's a, how we treat our seniors is a reflection of the heart and soul of the community or the mm-hmm. society. And I don't think we're treating our seniors fairly. Um, for the most part, these are seniors that have been working in blue collar jobs that uh, may not have uh, very much paid into social security, or if they do don't have a pension and, um, and work their entire life. Mm-hmm. And so I just think we've got to treat them differently. So I'm focusing on that uh, water, water is a huge issue. Um, and I think we had the opportunity this year to have captured some of that water, the trillions of uh, acre feet that fell right. during that um, atmospheric river. Mm-hmm. Um, we could have saved it and um, put it underground. Right. And we haven't done a good enough job of doing that. And so part part of that is a permitting process has to change in in some of our um some of the requirements that we have, uh, we need to set up an expedited permit process. So really what I want, I want govern, government to work better, right? right? We got to expedite it. Yeah, yeah, everything <laughs> is about expediting. But but really, there are areas where we could have saved. I, I've, I've come to the conclusion we're not going to build dams. We're just not going to build exactly. them. So let's figure out how to get that water underground as mm-hmm. quickly as possible. And in my district, it's estimated that 500,000 acres to a million acres will be put out of production, right. agriculture production, because of groundwater, the lack of groundwater and the subsidence, right? Which is the 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 earth subsiding yeah. because there's no we're we're depleting the water. Well, if we can increase the ability to get that water that was flowing right out to the ocean into underground storage, then um then we could weather these droughts a lot better. So we need to start doing You're that. You're like one of those billboards in your district now. Well, you know what? <laughs> I want to change the billboards. Yeah. So I want to change the bu- billboards because I want them. I want there to be hope, right? Um, people want to know you're working on trying to solve a problem, and right. and many of many of the billboards are very sad and um, and critical, and rightly so. But I also think that we have to have hope, and that's what we want to get out there and do. Do you know, billboards on other funny, people's yeah. property, right? I, I heard that last year there was a million, there's going to be a million less acres of farmable land in, in the Central Valley in uh, 10 years, I yep. think it is. Uh, and what that would do to the jobs and the economy and um, basically our food supply yep. would just be devastating. That's exactly right. Um, and you're right. When you hear that, you just kind of sink. You're just like, wow, it's just Well, and th- right? think of all those communities, right? right. They're, they're people that have lived there for generations mm-hmm. and- who have small businesses, who drive to work every day, right. won't have a job. Um, and then we're leaving the land fallow, which means it's a dust bowl because if you're not growing anything on it, then it, it, it's dust and it blows. Right. Um, we have valley fever, which li- are the spores that live in the soil. Mm-hmm. And um, so you can expect more, more illnesses related to um, a virus I think it's a virus. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. and um, 
And so, so it, it, it will make it the area unlivable. That's not acceptable to me. And I, we've got to do everything we can to figure out what are some of the solutions. Right. Putting solar panels out there and using those solar plan, panels to provide energy to the big cities does not appeal to me. Right. Um, it disturbs the natural environment because you have to put up chain link fences. There's no, there's no wildlife that can use the property once it's been fenced off and solar panels have been put right. on it. Um, there are no, that creates no permanent jobs. Um, it is, um, I don't know about you, but that's not something I'd want to live next to. Well, no, and you gotta, I realize like we have a special place, right? Like our climate, totally. our soul, soil is, is special and, and only certain stuff can grow here that that's right. anywhere in the world. So it's kind of like, if we don't grow it, then it, it's probably it, not going to grow. That's right. Or it's going to grow someplace that, you know, might not use the same uh, standards and care that, you know, we have here. So it's important the, to protect the highest have. labor, the highest, um, environmental. You're absolutely right. Yeah. That's right. Um, we so, want to produce, it's a national security issue. Right. If we have to depend on other countries for our food source, the minute they get mad at us, that's it. Right. right? right. So we need to produce our own food. I know, uh, some of your colleagues are looking at water bonds and things like that. Mm -hmm. Is that something you're participating in or, or looking at so, yourself? So let me just say that right now I'm, um, I'm, a Spectator, mm -hmm. um, we made promises in the last water bond. And if you ask people in the Valley, those promises were never kept. So I'm not interested in going out and having another discussion where I go like, yeah, 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 I know, I know we didn't keep those promises, right. but you know, please support this. Um, I want to make sure that, and it does say Central Valley. So that makes me feel a lot better. I want to make sure that <clears throat> we're really going to deliver what the valley needs, mm -hmm. and that it's not going to go somewhere else. Um, there was a recent article, and I want to say it was in the New York Times, that talked about the drought and its impact on California. And the only thing they talked about was how bad it was in the valley, and how um, and how it's all agriculture's fault that there's not enough water. And you know, my my head exploded right. because. Both the LA County and the uh, and San Francisco have built dams. They built them a hundred years ago, right. and so they are. Um, I don't want to say drought proof, but pretty close to drought proof because they they built these dams a hundred years ago. Well, the valley's been trying to build a dam for I don't know how long, right. and they've been thwarted because of good em environmental reasons. Mm. But my point is, it's not just about the valley and how much farmers use. It's about our refusal to look at the fact that there are other sources of water. Other countries are doing different things that if we did them as well, could help us solve the problem in California. We could make regions drought proof. The, the LA gets its water from the Delta, just like mm -hmm. the valley, right. as does San Diego. And the Southern California gets water from the Colorado River, just like we move water from the Delta. We need sustainability. We need to stop moving water from the Delta and look at local water sources and being able to get water uh, underground as quickly as possible um, is gonna be critically important, but also the possibility of building small um, desal uh, facilities right off the coast and doing it a way that is, um, environmentally sensitive, like they're doing in the Mediterranean, um, and, and protecting wildlife and, and, um, and species that are important to us. There are ways to do it. Right. We, we got to look at it and we got to be innovative and forward thinking. But sometimes we decide in, in the legislature that we, we're not going to look at those options because people decide they just don't want to do it. And right. I think it's short-sighted. It's kind of like last year, there was like the San Onofre or one of the nuclear power plants. Yes. Kind of like, kind of like that, right? Like people are exactly. like, exactly rooting off nuclear. We're not doing that. And it's kind of like, well, maybe we need to consider it. Well, it, like, it provides 10% of our energy right. and, and we can't build the alternatives fast enough. Right. We need some time. Yeah. So yes. You know, it's I guess exactly. what's kind of unique about your district is your district, I'll, I'll say, is maybe apolitical. It, it doesn't dominate one way or another. It's it's purple, right? It's purple. Uh, it's not apolitical. Yeah. People are very, <laughs> political, very, very but, political, but but, <laughs> but it is purple. Yes. Right. It doesn't shoot one way or another. I guess, you know, having a constituency like that, 
and living in a very, you know, I guess very political world where things are, you know, try to be black and white up here. Uh, kind of how do you how do you represent your district and kind of their views and kind of bring that up here and, and, and operate effectively? Well, it's it's difficult because um, I, I, I see myself as more as more practical mm -hmm. and I want practical solutions. And sometimes that's that's not what um, what other communities are pushing. And and sometimes it's not what the party is pushing. Right. right. So um, so I just. I think a big part of what I've had to do is to learn the subject areas that I we're going to have disagreement on really well mm -hmm. so that I can make an argument about why I feel the way that I do. Um, there is an opportunity in the Central Valley. People are anxious for good paying jobs, number one. And number two is the region is um, is very heavily dependent on fossil fuel, the production of fossil fuel. Um, and so if you're going to get rid of those jobs, there have to be replacement uh, jobs. And it's replacement jobs that pay $100,000 a year for someone that hasn't gone to college, for example, um, and that um, helps them to utilize the skills that they've learned on the job, um, whether it's uh, pipe fitting and um, welding and all of those kinds of things, the, the trades. Mm -hmm. um, and so... Uh, as I look at it, um, we have an obligation to clean agricultural uh, byproducts. So all of the things you cut off the trees and the weeds you pull right, and all that kind right. of good stuff, um, it's done right now with open air burning. Um, you just put it in a pile and light, light a match. That has to stop by 2025. So what are they going to do with all that dead stuff? It's very similar to the Sierras with the dead and dying trees. Right. Um, it's biomass, and biomass has gotten much better over the years. It it no longer is is coal operated or diesel operated mm -hmm. engines, um, and because we've required them to scrub everything that that it that go, would would go out of pipe, they have perfected the the ability to use biomass. But because biomass is seen as a polluting industry, right. there's all this objection to using biomass. They're good paying jobs. And it, it gets rid of waste. We're not sending the waste to China or to Africa, which mm -hmm. is what we do with our waste, right? So there are there's there's biomass opportunities. There's carbon capture. We have to capture carbon if we're going to meet our climate goals. The perfect place to store it is in used oil fields. That's in the valley. So there are lots of opportunities for us to build the um, pathway for labor in um, the trades in the valley, but we've got to have the will to do it. Yeah. And that means people that are willing to learn the subject matter and to say, yes, this is how we're going to achieve our climate goals, which are important to you. But um, but there, we're also going to employ people with a livable wage and use the land in a way that's much more responsible. You know, it's, it's kind of interesting. I guess your your uh, background is, you know, organizing farm labor, mm -hmm. uh, kind of in, in the corporate town, and then kind of here now, kind of we're at this kind of crisis where we've lost a lot of our, our manufacturing, our businesses that used to be in the Central Valley because of NAFTA, they're now gone south. That's right. And, you know, you talk to the farmers, and the farmers are kind of talking about, well, they don't have, you know, labor. Right. Uh, their labor's aging and things like that kind of. What are the solutions here to kind of help, I guess, you know, bring back manufacturing and kind of, you know, bring back kind of more farm labor to help our farmers? Well, that's part of biomass and carbon capture. That's the manufacturing or the the heavy industry, I guess mm -hmm. you would say. But the other thing is that um, agriculture is changing. It is no longer back backbreaking labor that's doing things. It's machines. And part, part of the reason the transition is that labor is aging and um, we we are not seeing the influx of labor coming from south south of the border. And so we have a labor shortage. Mm -hmm. And so the farmers are moving to, to new technology, drip irrigation, um, sensors in the field that tell them data and information about the soil type when you add uh, soil amendments, um, what's happening with the plants, Somebody needs to be able to read that. Somebody needs to be able to 
uh, have it on their cell phone, right. look at it and determine what needs to be done. And so um, there's a collaborative right now in the Central Valley. It's called F3. It's being organized by the Community Foundation of Fresno. And it includes all of the community colleges in the region, in the three county region, um, maybe a, the fourth county, maybe Stanislaus, so Merced, Madera, and Fresno. And the um, UC Merced and Fresno State, um, they have received close to $100 million in grants between the state government and the federal government to retool re the workforce and to create the cur curriculum to, um, through the community college system where you can get certificates that will um, take your training as a farm worker because it t it's a skill right. and give you credits for what you've learned and then uh, give you additional education so that um, you can be deployed to run the equipment and to do the readings and and to oh, do do yeah. the work that's going to be necessary. In, in other words, the um, the way that people work will be entirely different. And if we can do it here in California, it can be done anywhere in the world. So it it will uh, provide a, a real step up in education for a workforce that has traditionally been very low paying. Um, that people assume is unskilled, but really is not. So I'm real excited about this because I think there's real there's a, a real opportunity to make a substantive difference in, in the lives of the families of, of farm workers. So I'm, I'm excited. Yeah. And it's kind of interesting. Everyone talks about, you know, artificial intelligence, all this technology, and we're going to lose jobs. And it's kind of like, oh, we're losing them anyways. Right? Yes. And so, yeah. How, yes. How can we make you, uh, I guess, work smarter instead of harder? That's yeah. exactly right. right. That's that's the whole the whole um, thesis of this. Yeah. How can we work, we help you work smarter and then have you earn more money doing that? because it, it's a skill. Right, so we're, we're coming into busy season, right? Committees are coming up, uh, budget season's coming up. Kind of what's your, I guess, next month looking like? Very busy, <laughs> very busy. Um, we, we're, we are starting our, our, our hearings and so that it'll be a really busy time. We have been busy already because um, the Senate decided that we needed to start doing oversight hearings. Mm -hmm. And um, so all the committees have been encouraged to pick two or three subjects and then do some oversight hearings. So it's been, right. it's it's added hearings at a time when usually it's pretty chill, but right. not right now. Yeah. We're, we're very busy. We've been working well, hard. Well, I know you're busy and you got to go, but thank you so much for stopping by and thank talking you. to us. It was very fascinating and uh, looking forward to the work you're going to do this year. Great. Thank you all so right. much for having me. Thanks, Anna. Appreciate Bye. it.